This video covers the most ambitious undertaking in the history of clean energy production. A project so monumental, it could change the course of humanity forever. With a price tag of $20 billion, ITER, involving scientists from 35 nations, aims to create a star on Earth, a machine 10 times hotter than the sun's core. This audacious France-based endeavor seeks to produce virtually endless clean energy by mimicking the very process that fuels our sun and stars. Hi, I'm Namo Abdullah, and this is Next, where we delve into the latest innovations and cutting-edge technologies shaping our future. In this episode, we take you on an, an exclusive behind-the-scenes tour of the sprawling Eder site, where diverse cultures collaborate to change the world. What we're doing here is even more important than, than putting men on the moon. Meet Eder's chief scientist and discover the project's progress and origins. We are trying to, let's say, reproduce or put a small part of the sun inside the box here. Learn how global conflicts impact Eder's progress. Everything that is done with Russia or coming from Russia or going to Russia is impacted by the sanctions. In the picturesque region of southern France, a massive area, about 180 hectares, has been set aside for a project that could reshape our future. To give you an idea, that's bigger than 400 soccer fields. This enormous project includes 39 buildings and is buzzing with hundreds of hardworking people. The project is known as ITER, short for the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor. I have been granted a rare opportunity to visit this massive facility in Kadagash and see how the revolutionary machine is being built. Could you tell us where we are going right now and what this place used to be before uh, being turned into uh, this facility for ITER? Okay, this place used to be a forest. Um, so it was one of the contribution of France as the host country of the ITER project was to deliver a platform um, equipped uh, to the ITER organization. This was done between 2007 and 2009. In 2010, uh, construction began in earnest uh, on this platform to build the industrial installation and the massive building that hosts uh, the machine. Robert, who has worked here for over 15 years, is a former journalist and co-author of a book on ITER. He will be our tour guide today, giving us an overview of the facility. But first, let's explain what ITER is and how it works. As mentioned earlier, ITER stands for the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor. The key word here is thermonuclear. The process, called nuclear fusion, involves heating atoms to 150 million degrees Celsius, which is 10 times the heat at the sun's core, in order to fuse two forms of hydrogen to produce helium. What are we doing here? Uh, it's, it's clearly we are trying to reproduce the basic nuclear reactions that take place in the sun, in all the stars and so on which has never been done, at least in a mastered way, uh, on Earth. Mm -hmm. So we are trying to, let's say, reproduce or put a small part of the sun inside the box here. That's as simple as that, or as complex as that. The fusion reaction involves two isotopes or forms of hydrogen, deuterium and tritium. And when you manage to fuse those guys, uh, you get a nuclear reaction, you get the production of helium and neutrons, in particular in this reaction, and this creates a huge amount of energy. Mm -hmm. And this is what we want to capture, of course, uh, to put in a box and then to use it as, uh, uh, as wanted uh, to create electricity or anything else. And by doing so, you lose a little bit of mass. So if you weight the products, it's a bit lighter than what you had at the beginning. And this mass actually it has turned into energy. That's the meaning of the famous Einstein relation, E equals mc squared, that everybody has seen 
once mm -hmm. uh, on a blackboard. Don't confuse nuclear fusion with nuclear fission. The latter involves splitting uranium, a costly and potentially dangerous method of energy production currently being used by many countries. The former is the subject of this program. But how can any container endure the extreme heat needed to enable nuclear fusion? Wouldn't millions of degrees Celsius turn any material into dust? There is no material box, so we, you have to have a virtual box. The virtual box can be created using powerful magnets, as discovered by Soviet physicists Andrei Sakharov and Igor Tam in the 1950s. We all know that magnets can both attract and repel things. These Russian scientists call such a device a tokamak, a massive donut-shaped structure equipped with superconducting magnets to trap the fusion reaction, which exists in a state of matter known as plasma. Think of plasma as a fiery soup of charged particles. The magnets keep the plasma away from the walls of the tokamak. The inner tokamak will be a giant 30 meter wide, 23,000 ton marvel exploring the mysteries of the universe right here on Earth. This magnet uh, is inside a cryostat, and this cryostat is 30 meter high, 30 meter wide. That's the size of the machine. What we're doing here is even more important than, than putting men on the moon, because mm. if we meet our objectives, we will have an energy source for millennia to come. Later in this video, we will take you inside France's National Research Center, where a functioning tokamak has already been built. A recent scientific breakthrough has ignited new optimism for achieving nuclear fusion right here on Earth. The discovery happened at the National Ignition Facility, NIF, a giant laboratory in California that has 192 powerful lasers. The NIF scientists focus these lasers on a tiny metal capsule containing a small hydrogen fuel pellet. The lasers heated and compressed the fuel to such an extent that it started to fuse and release energy. The whole process took 20 billionth of a second, but for the first time in this extraordinary experiment, the energy output was greater than the energy input, about 50% more. This means that the scientists achieved what is called energy gain, which is a key milestone for nuclear fusion research. The experiment was first done in December 2022 and then repeated in August 2023. The recent breakthrough of, of, of US was to go beyond the, the, this factor of one, this, this amplification factor of one, around 1 1.5 or something. Uh, yes, so through this channel that was the first time, the very first time, there was a scientific demonstration, very, very important one, scientific breakthrough that, yes, we can do it also this way. Uh, but the magnetic fusion channel is way beyond this. We are at the level of time. trying to pre-industrialize a level of 10 uh, on uh, hundreds of seconds, if not hours. We've made enormous progress uh, towards fusion. And, and one way to measure things is how much energy you gain from fusion compared to how much energy you have to put in the, in the system. And ITER has the objective of producing at least 10 times more energy than you put in. The synthesis of this at a level where this machine will create 500 megawatt of fusion energy out of 50 megawatts of heating power of, the, of how you, you make it hot. So is tokamak purely theoretical or have we successfully developed operational prototypes? The first tokamak known as T1 was created in 1958. Since that milestone, researchers worldwide have built over 100 tokamaks of different sizes and designs. One of the most notable ones is in France. I'm here at CEA, France's prestigious public research institution focused on alternative and atomic energy, where groundbreaking advancements have been made in the field of fusion energy. Just behind me, there is the West Tokamak. So it's a Tokamak which previously was named Torsupra and starts in, 1880, in 1988. So 
more than 30 years ago. Uh, recently, we have a great distokamak in order to change the component inside to be more relevant to what will be in iter. So the experiment that we are doing here are very, very relevant for what will be the iter machine. Mm. Those similar plasma or similar condition and similar material facing the plasma. So that's what we are doing here, uh, making experiments in order to get some confidence about the iter results. You've tried this tokamak, right? And it works, right? You can uh, hold the plasma there, no yeah. problem. And just can you talk about the whole thing? Yeah, this tokamak in particular has been made from the beginning in order to make plasma that lasts for long durations. Uh, the records which we achieved, longest. The, the longest is uh, in the previous phase of the machine, which was Torfi Powell, uh, 6 minutes and 30 seconds. What is the problem? Why can't we produce more energy with this tokamak yet? Um, the thing with tokamak is in order to produce more energy by the fusion energy that you can have in the hot plasma inside, you require to have a big plasma. I mean, and so this is the reason why, I mean, even if this machine can be, seems big, it's not big enough in order to produce more power than we uh, provide in order to hit the plasma. Does uh, the plasma in this tokamak get as hot as it will in the either 150 million degrees Celsius? Uh, not as hot. I mean, on this plasma, I mean, the temperatures can be is lower. So let's say in degrees between 10 to 50 million of degrees. So mm -hmm. not uh, 100 and 150. Again, that's pretty mostly uh, one of the reasons is because of the of the size of the of the machine. It doesn't directly make electricity, of course. It makes a lot of heat, which will be used to turn water into steam. This steam then spins the blades of a turbine, generating electricity. But what are ITER's main challenges today, and when can we see real results? So ITER is currently in the assembly phase, mm -hmm. so it means that all the components which have been manufactured by mm -hmm. different member states are brought to the site and then assembled. Uh, in the in the machine, and so a number of these, well, actually two of these components have defects, manufacturing defects, mm -hmm. and that's at the heart of the current challenges ITER is facing. So essentially, there is the big vacuum vessel. So that's the box you built, which is 11 meter tall and 20 meters in diameter. So it's a really big thing, and so that's one of the issues. And then there is a second issues, um, issue, which a component called the thermal shield, that, that's something protecting the magnets in the machine from the heat. Um, and there are pipes on these components uh, where helium will be flowing. And because of a, a design issue in the manufacturing process, uh, there has been uh, corrosion inside these pipes and this took time to appear and it turns out the, it was discovered only once this part was assembled into the machine so now they have to fix it and in order to fix it they have to disassemble part of this uh, and, and fix the components. When did we first come up with the idea of nuclear fusion and why haven't we been able to make it a reality for producing energy? The short answer is not that long ago. In 1920, British physicist Arthur Eddington was the first to discover that stars derive their energy from the fusion of hydrogen into helium. In 1938, US physicist Hans Bethe demonstrated that nuclear fusion is the same process that powers the stars, a discovery earning him a Nobel Prize in 1967. The idea to create ITER, an international collaborative organization, dates back to a meeting between Soviet Union leader Mikhail Gorbachev and U.S. President Ronald Reagan in Geneva during the final years of the Cold War. At that time, 1985, when they met and when they wanted really to, to rejoin in a sense, uh, they were looking for symbols, for big symbols of this, uh, of this new era. Uh, of your work being impacted by this conflict in Ukraine? Exactly, yeah. For the reason... In what ways could you explain? Uh, for the reason that Russia is one of our partners. Mm -hmm. Russia is manufacturing elements. Russia is 
co-working with the others, with Japan, with Europe, with the US, in, in, in elaborating solutions, manufacturing bits and pieces, transporting th things from here and there. And now everything that is done with Russia or coming from Russia or going to Russia is impacted by the sanctions, by the, by the, 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 the aspects that so it's extremely difficult, it's much more and more difficult for them and for us to, to work together. Some critics argue that ITER is a far-fetched dream that diverts resources from other vital research areas. Fusion is not part of the solutions for, 20, for, for, the, for this century. It may be part of the solutions for the next century. If you take the money from general research, then it's, it's terrible because it, it will take all the money. So it's, it's, it's so much money. So um, the money should be taken from somewhere else than basic research. The people at ITER acknowledge that ITER is a long-term project aiming to achieve fusion energy during the second half of this century. They believe that it is worth the investment because it has the potential to provide a clean, safe, and abundant source of energy for humanity. Initially, I think it was supposed to be 4 billion euros. Now they say it's between 18 to 20 billion euros. Well, the, the cost of the project, I think, is really related to this first-of-a-kind thing and the fact that you're asking people to manufacture for you uh, things which they never did before mm -hmm. and which are on a scale uh, which is very large so so if you if you ask somebody to fix your house and to do something extremely fancy uh, if he's not sure he can do it, he will ask for a lot of money. I mean, it's an ambitious project. It's very important for the future of mankind. And I think it sounds, it's sort of grand words, but it really motivates me on a daily basis, I have to say. I really like it. I, I like to be part of a project like that, an international project that takes on an issue that will uh, help us all in the future. As a chief scientist, how does it make you feel working on a uh, such an ambitious project like nuclear fusion that you know that could solve the energy problem for good yeah so first of all i mean you have to understand that this is a, a more than a lifetime work and a more than a one person work and this is at least for me what is uh, what is my what is and was and is still my main motivation i've been working in fusion from the very beginning from my phd thesis so 35 years ago <laughs> sorry about that <laughs> and uh, honestly and believe me here when we are working together nobody is russian nobody is chinese nobody is japanese or european we are really working together targeting a scientific and technological technological big challenge so we should be hopeful and it's promising that uh, given the fact that so many countries are working together, investing billions of dollars in this project, that we will have nuclear fusion energy sometime during this century. Uh, for, for me, yes, no doubt. Otherwise I would do something Yes, let me put it this way. It is no doubt a visionary project, mimicking the stars to produce energy for the benefit of humanity. If or when it succeeds, it could provide a clean, safe, and abundant energy source, transforming the world. Energy will be so plentiful and affordable that no one would ever have to fight for it. However, it is also a complex and challenging project, requiring decades of research and development. Scientists estimate that it will take nearly 50 years to achieve fusion energy. This means that we cannot rely on it alone to solve our energy problems. We need to continue using and improving other renewable energy sources such as solar and wind to reduce our carbon footprint and combat climate change. It is not a magic bullet, but a long-term investment that could pay off in the future. It's a testament to human curiosity, creativity, and cooperation that could change the course of history. Until next time, goodbye. Thank <laughs> you.